Hi, I'm Eric Kohler, and today I'll talk about how to use the app Rheometer. We'll start by talking about what a rheometer measures. The rheometer measures the relationship between shear stress and shear weight. For concrete, this relationship is often described with a Bingham model. And the Bingham model relates the shear stress and shear weight by a straight line. The intercept of this line is the yield stress. The yield stress describes the minimum stress needed to initiate or maintain flow. The plastic viscosity is then the slope of the line, and the plastic viscosity describes the resistance to flow once the yield stress is exceeded. So when we measure rheology with the iPariometer, we're going to measure this relationship between shear stress and shear rate. We'll then fit this line, this Bingham model line, to the data to determine our yield stress and plastic viscosity. Now, typically, yield stress is related to the slump. Uh, the higher the yield stress, the lower the slump. Concrete with high plastic viscosity is typically termed as being very sticky and cohesive. We can also make a further distinction between static yield stress and dynamic yield stress. Static yield stress describes the minimum stress to initiate flow from rest. So when the concrete has been sitting, it's at rest, it's very common for a Isotropic behavior to build up and cause a very high uh, yield stress. Once we shear the concrete, though, that the fixotropic effect is broken down and the yield stress is much lower. That lower yield stress, after the breakdown of any effects of fixotropy, is, is termed the dynamic yield stress. The IPAR rheometer, as we'll see, enables us to measure both of those. And as I mentioned before, the big difference between static and dynamic yield stress is due to fixotropy. And that's another parameter we can measure with the iCariometer. The iCariometer is based on a vein geometry. And we measure the amount of torque acting on the vein as it rotates at different speeds. We always use the same size vein. It's 125 millimeters in both diameter and in height. And we position the vein in the center of the container. The container, you'll notice, has strips on the side. These prevent slippage. And when we fill the container with concrete, we always fill to the top of the strips. We use different container sizes depending on the maximum aggregate size. And the minimum space between the vein and the container should always be at least four times the maximum aggregate size. It can be larger, but it should never be less. So now to a simple the rheometer, what we'll do is we will insert the vein into the keyless chuck of the rheometer itself. We'll then tighten this down. We always put the stem of the rheometer all the way in, which means it will be positioned correctly at the correct height. We then use the frame to position it correctly. Once we have it in the container, we just secure the straps so that everything is firm. We then connect the rheometer itself via a USB cable to our computer. And of course, we have to power the rheometer with our DC power supply. Now let's take a look at the rheometer software. First thing we do is we set up the location and name of the file. So we first click on the choose directory and decide where we want to save the file. Today we'll save on the desktop. We then input the name of the file. So I'm going to call this first test, test one. We can then decide whether or not we want to report a raw data file. Now every test automatically writes a summary file with all the information we need from the test. The raw data file shows all of the raw torque and rotation speed data. We don't normally run that. We can run it if we need for diagnostics. So today, we won't run that. The next box is the geometry. And when we open up the software, the values in these fields are already preset to the most common size. The only size we need to change would be 
radius of the container. And I mentioned before, we vary the container radius based on the maximum aggregate size. The next thing we do is we need to zero out the torque so that when there is zero torque acting on the vein, the rheometer is actually reading zero torque. And we want to do this at the beginning of the day and then between every test. So the way we do that is we come to this torque reset. We have our rheometer set up, as you see here, with no material touching the vein. So we're confident that there is zero torque acting on the vein. We then press reset. We watch for that light to illuminate. When the green light turns off, we reset our torque. The other option across the top here is the abort test, which lets us stop the test in progress if we ever need to. And you also see the green test status light here, which illuminates whenever the test is in progress. Now let's take a look at the two types of tests we can perform. We can do a stress growth test and a flow curve test. The stress growth test measures the static yield stress. It rotates the vein at a slow, fixed speed, and we monitor the increase in torque on the stress growth test plot. The flow curve test, on the other hand, operates the vein at different speeds, and it can operate anywhere between 0 and 0 0.6 revolutions per second. And we use that to measure the flow curve and to get the being of parameters, yield stress, and plasma viscosity. Okay, so now we're going to run both a stress growth test and a flow curve test. And I'm just going to take the rheometer and insert the vein very carefully into the center of the concrete and let the frame slide right on. The rule of thumb is if the concrete is too stiff to push the rheometer vein down in the concrete, it's too stiff to test. We'll start with the stress growth test. The stress growth test again measures the static yield stress. So it's very important that we have a consistent shear history. In other words, the time since we've filled the container till the time we start the test should be consistent in order to compare two or more tests. The, the software is already set up to operate at 0 0.025 revolutions per second, which is the speed we want. So all we have to do is press start. It takes a few seconds to start the test. Once it starts, you'll hear the rheometer turning and you'll see the stress gradually increase. You'll watch till it hits a maximum, which is related to the static yield stress. Once we see that it's hit a maximum, we hit finish, and we're done with the test. And so now, after the test is finished, we see the maximum torque and the static yield stress of 279 pascals. And we see down here the message at the bottom, our stress growth test is complete. So with the stress growth test complete, we'll now run a flow curve test on the same sample. And it's okay to do that, to run the stress growth test first and then the flow curve test. Again, with the flow curve test, we can put in our different parameters for how the test operates. The rheometer is pre-populated with parameters that we found work well for most concretes. So of course you can customize as needed. The test is going to consist of two phases. First is the breakdown phase, where for the breakdown time, we operate at the breakdown speed. The purpose of the breakdown is to eliminate the effects of fixotropy. We then run the test at different speeds. So in this case, we'll do seven points at five seconds per point, starting at 0.5 and then going to 0 0.05 revolutions per second. Once we're ready, we just press start. It takes a second for the test to start. So you can now hear the rheometer is going through different speeds. And while the rheometer is going through different speeds, we're seeing it plotted out in real time on the screen. Okay, so now we have our data plotted. So you can see we plotted points at seven different speeds. And we then fit two sets of parameters here. We have our relative parameters, which is just a straight line fit of the torque versus rotation speed data. And then we have our Bingham parameters, which is actually fitting the Bingham model parameters of uh, yield stress and plasma viscosity to the data. So the relative parameters are essentially zero 
for the y, or the intercept of the straight line, and v, or the slope, is 3.1. Our straight line fit is very good here. We have an r squared of 0.98. Now looking at the Bingham parameters, we have a yield stress of zero, which is very typical of self-compacting concrete, which is what we're testing here today. And then we have a plastic viscosity of 59. And the last value, MSE, is the mean squared error. That number should be as close to zero as, as possible. 0 0.02 here is an excellent fit. As I mentioned before, the software writes a summary file. Here's a summary file for the stress growth test we ran. You can see it starts off with the file name and the time and date of the test. Tell us we ran a stress growth test and that we operated at a speed of 0 0.025 revolutions per second. It also records the geometry. It then tells us the peak torque and the calculated yield stress, which in this case is, remember, the static yield stress. For the flow curve test, again, it starts with the file name, the date, and time. It has the test input, so our breakdown, time and speed, our initial and final speeds, the number of points, the time per point. It has the geometry. It then calculates the relative parameters, our y and v, and our Bingham parameters of yield stress and plastic viscosity. It then has the flow curve points. So these are the different speeds and the average torque recorded at each speed. So we get a lot of questions about how to measure thixotropy. And there's actually two ways to measure thixotropy with the iperiometer. The first is like what we did today, which is where we measured the static yield stress with the stress growth test, then the dynamic yield stress with the flow curve test. The difference between those two yield stresses is an indication of thixotropy. The greater the difference, the greater the thixotropy. So the second way is using just the flow curve test, and this is sometimes called a hysteresis curve. What we do here is we measure an initial flow curve when the concrete has been at rest, and we have the effects of thixotropy affecting the flow curve. We then run a second flow curve right after that, after we've broken down the effects of thixotropy. So the difference between those curves, the area between those curves, or the hysteresis, is an indication of thixotomy. And so to run that curve with the iperiometer is, we actually have to run two flow curve tests back to back. So for the first flow curve test, we'll set the breakdown time to one. And that's because we want the concrete to be initially at rest. We'll then set the initial breakdown speed to our minimum speed. In this case, we'll say 0 0.05 revolutions per second. We then set the initial speed to the low speed, 0 0.05, and the final speed to the maximum speed, in this case, 0.5. We'll then press start to run this test. Now, while the test is in progress, we can go ahead and start to program in our second flow curve test parameters. So here, we want to set the initial breakdown time to be high because we want to have a long breakdown period at high speed to eliminate any effects of thixotropy. So we'll set it here. In this case, we'll do a full 60 seconds at our maximum speed that we'll run for this particular test, 0.5 revolutions per second. We'll set the initial speed to 0.5, the final speed to point. 0, 0.5, we'll then press start and let the test run again. Once we record those two tests, we'll analyze the data, measure the area between the two curves, and calculate that as thixotropy. So that's all there is to performing a test with the iperiometer. Thanks for watching.